Hello, I'm Juliet Mann. Welcome to the Agenda podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. And in this episode, as China throws its doors open wider post-COVID, we'll hear from the presidents of two developing countries looking to reap the benefits. We start with Costa Rica, which was one of the first Latin American nations to sign up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. I spoke to President Rodrigo Chavez Robles to see why he was so keen to forge closer ties with Beijing. Costa Rica doesn't have a lot of investment from the Belt and Road. As a matter of fact, uh, we do have a road under construction. It's about 80 kilometers. And we are expecting, it has been, there has been a lot of delay. We are expecting to complete it within this year. However, not only were we the first or one of the first countries in Latin America to sign with China the Belt and Road, we have free trade agreements with the United States, Canada, and Mexico. We have free trade agreements with the European Union, free trade agreement with China. Costa Rica is a very open country. We like to bring the world to Costa Rica and Costa Rica to the world. So that's one of the things we have been saying in Davos. So do you, do you see yourselves as rather a, a beacon of cooperation, which is one of the messages here at Davos, that everyone should be taking more concerted collective action? Costa Rica has done its part. We are a tiny country, 57,000 square kilometers, 5.2 million people. However, we are the only country that has reversed tropical deforestation. But not not only we stop it, uh, we went from 24% to forest coverage in the 90s, 80s, and we are at more than 55, more than uh, forest coverage. 25% of our area is protected on land, and we have one of the largest, relative to the size of the country, protection program of the oceans. So we are doing our generation matrix of electricity is 100% for practical purposes sustainable. So we have been doing our part. Hopefully the rest of the world will do it in environment, in human rights, and in freedoms as we are doing. You brought up electricity, so let's talk about that now, because you, you, you've said that, that Costa Rica over-invested in electricity generation, was too reliant on fossil fuels, and that the rivers were too polluted. I mean, then you'd only been in office for about 15 days, I think. So now you're sort of more embedded. You know, what's your take? No, I didn't say we are too reliant on fossil fuels for electricity. What I said is that the country over-invested in generation capacity And that's why we have been, in only eight months of my administration, been able to drop electricity prices by about 30%. Why? Because we opened the market and we are exporting electricity. Before, we had too much capacity to generate and and we were not exporting electricity. We do have a problem with the management of solid uh, waste. As a matter of fact, one of the meetings that I will have today here in Davos is with a large group that wants to convert solid waste into energy, and that would help us. The management of solid waste uh, is uh, causing trouble in our river basins, and we do need to work investing more in water treatment, uh, sewage treatment centers. But those are challenges uh, that are remaining, but we have done very well environmentally. So you're having lots of climate-related conversations, but I do want, want to go back to trade. Uh, because Costa Rica is China's second and biggest trading partner, and you export more than 200 um, kinds of goods to China. So how do you see development between the, the, the two nations going? Will China reopening its economy make a big impact on you? We do have a comparatively large trade with China, We import more from them than we export to them. It's a substantial deficit. We think that what matters in the world is that all engines of growth are functioning. And which are the big uh, centers of economic uh, sort of gravitational force? The US, Europe, and China. So the fact that China hopefully will reopen, hopefully will 
go back to high rates of growth is going to help everybody in the world, especially if those big uh, economic uh, centers collaborate. And we know what is happening uh, with uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the sort of friction that China, the U.S., and the EU are having in that sense. So Costa Rica's a small country is calling for everybody to do their part. You've mentioned all those geopolitical risks. Um, there are some socioeconomic risks too, that the cost of living crisis and um, putting pressure on communities all around the world. Um, how is Costa Rica coping with that? Costa Rica is offering uh, inflation as uh, most countries. We had an inflation rate this year of about, uh, well, it's about to be formally announced, uh, but my estimation is going to be about 8.3%. Uh, is high, but certainly not at the levels that we have seen in other OECD countries, uh, and certainly not at the levels of Argentina, Turkey, and the like. So we have been giving cash transfers to the poorest households to compensate uh, the price increases on food especially. So that's the way we're helping the most disadvantaged in society. At the same time, oil prices and gasoline prices have been dropping substantially. Electricity prices, in contrast to Europe, in Costa Rica, as I mentioned a minute ago, have dropped about 30% in the last eight months. That's very good for us. Some uh, of the influencers who I've been speaking to here say we've got to stop trying to put band-aids on the problem. Do you worry that some of the measures that communities are taking and countries are taking um, to address short-term issues aren't going to last and create that longer-term growth, sustainability um, and green transition? Look, uh, the green transition has to happen. It's, it's, it's a necessity. Uh, it is easy to postpone when you have short planning horizons for governments, elections in short periods of time, uh, that changes incentives. And yes, there is a risk in the, uh, at the moment that that political urgency may turn into short-term measures that would only worsen the future situation. Particularly worrisome is the fact that some governments uh, are trying to subsidize uh, short-term consumption of fuels, as, as you correctly point out, Juliet. So the idea would be to move, reduce consumption now that the prices are high, people tend to substitute, that creates opportunity to invest in other sources of energy that are more sustainable. And I think it's a difficult task, but it's a necessary task to undertake, as we are doing in Costa Rica. It's a, it's a, it's a big task, a necessary task, but, um, but a big task. And, and I'm thinking of Costa Rica as a real pioneer of ecotourism. It's a haven for, for ecotourism. So, yes, of course, there can always be more things done to, to limit the impacts of climate change. How can you get a larger leverage, if you like, with the countries that can make a bigger impact to address the problems? We do have a great ecotourism industry. Actually, the experience, and I'm talking to your audience now, that you will have in Costa Rica, the enormous diversity of climates, landscapes, mountains, beaches, this is a commercial paid advertisement <laughs> almost. You will not find anywhere in the world with, at the same time, the safety, uh, the good logistics for tourism. That said, we have a moral voice that is bigger than our size. Why? Costa Rica is a country that abolished the army more than 70 years ago. We have lived by law and not by weapons. We don't have tanks, we don't have uh, fighter uh, airplanes. We have invested in people, in education, and in health, human capital. That we can say, we have been at peace, we have almost uninterrupted 200 years of democracy, all freedoms and equality for all groups, all minorities in our country. We have parity of gender in Congress by law and parity of gender in my cabinet by choice. So, Juliet, 
if that small country in the middle of a rough area of the world historically was able to do it, what well, you said, the big boys and girls in the world should be able to do it. So we speak with example, not with demagoguery. All right, I want to book my ticket. I'm on my way. <laughs> Please come, you will be our dear guest. President, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. It's been 20 years since East Timor gained independence from Indonesia, but high unemployment and poverty still plague the country. So what's the way forward? The country's president, Jose Ramos Horta, explained why China is so important to his nation's future. Well, China is an indispensable partner. And uh, I personally do not agree at all with a lot of uh, China bashing going on in the United States, in Europe, in Australia. Uh, well, we have to understand China's history. China went through generations of poverty, of humiliation, and uh, then emerged through their own absolute uh, willpower and uh, strong leadership to be number two global economy. And they have done their best to contribute uh, in their own selfish interest. Obviously, no one, uh, you know, if uh, China is not a gigantic philanthropy, China is a country with its interests. And uh, in that context, they have helped tremendously throughout Africa, Latin America, Asia. And East Timor. And East Timor. We have a very good relationship with China going back when we had, uh, we were extremely poor. And even when we, when we were poor, we supported the one China policy. We didn't uh, go into the checkbook diplomacy. We didn't ask China for anything in return. So we have very good partnership with China. Uh, we have zero loan from China, so we don't have any debt with China. And our debt is minor compared to our GDP, it's primarily with ADB. Asian Development and IFC. Uh, China has been very much a, uh, a real generous in supporting us without any conditions. So what are the opportunities you see for further cooperation between East Timor and China? You know, what projects are already underway um, um, and what's coming up in the future? Uh, I would like to see far greater Chinese support to us in the agriculture sector, across the board, in the agriculture sector, in uh, uh, our small scale industries of food processing. I want to see more China's involvement in our infrastructure development, in roads, bridges, airports, in the health system, like helping us build more uh, modern hospitals. Uh, all of this China can do. We are relatively small, only 1.5 million. We have our own resources. We are not poverty stricken. We have oil, gas. We have billions of dollars in our sovereign fund. Uh, recently, we inaugurated the biggest uh, project in Timor, uh, a new port, modern automated port, uh, China Harbor, a big Chinese company. They were the builders. It, no, it was no Chinese grant or Chinese loan. It was a public-private partnership uh, initiative that involved our government, IFC, World Bank, and the French giant company called Bolloré. But then we contracted China Harbor to build uh, the port. Totally automated, one of the most modern in Southeast Asia now. So that's in partnership with, uh, with uh, China Harbor, but I, I repeat, not loan, not grant from China. So we work as equal partners. I know you're keen for more investment in agriculture to ensure food yeah. security, but your, your economy is very heavily dependent exactly. on oil and gas. So what, what are you doing to, to move towards that green transition? What, what do you need to get to that, that carbon-friendly future? Only with the development with our existing potential oil and gas resources, 
we can then, 20 years from now, uh, be able to declare that we are 100% in green economy. For those who talk about uh, no more uh, new oil and gas explorations, I would tell them, please tell it to the Americans, tell it to the Europeans, tell it to, uh, to Saudi Arabia, to Venezuela, uh, not us, because we are very new in oil and gas. And uh, our contribution to CO2 emission is zero point zero 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 endless zeros. So, uh, we have, uh, so we are going to develop our Timor Sea wealth, which plenty of gas. This year we are signing agreements to bring pipeline from the Timor Sea to East Timor to develop our uh, gas industry, which we need. It's our lifeline. So it's your lifeline, so you're going to continue in that field and we your green will. transition is almost as long as your country's been around. <laughs> yes, exactly, yes, exactly, yeah. Because you, you are a very young country. Um, you're also one of the world's poorest countries. Yes. I mean, you know, are you worried that this global battle for poverty reduction has maybe lost momentum amid the cost of living crisis, amid the pandemic, amid all the geopolitical tensions that we have? It is a tragedy, you know, and no one to blame. Uh, the global pandemic, COVID-19, uh, uh, 19 and then as if that was only enough as a tragedy for humanity we have the war in uh, ukraine with all its uh, impact on the global economy so it is a catastrophe for everybody in the midst of it uh, uh, the un is very much weakened uh, fractured because of uh, the permanent member security council do not see eye to eye uh, their own selfish interests, their own perception of each other, their own suspicion of each other. Well, a block uh, really defeat the multilateralism, uh, defeat international partnerships. So here in Davos, we try uh, uh, to see whether governments working with private sector, working with the people who own trillions and trillions of dollars. Five percent of the, of the world, they own 95 percent of the wealth. Whether these five percent who own most of the, wealth, of the world's wealth can uh, uh, make, contribute more to eliminate extreme poverty in the world. President Hortra, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Agenda Podcast. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Agenda Podcast. Do join me next week when I'll be finding out what China's rapid urbanization really means for global economic development. And remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more Agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.